okay so this is uh, chapter 34 and in here we shall be looking at uh, Maxwell's equations so in the previous chapters we looked at various uh, theories uh, we looked at uh, various laws we looked at Gauss's law Faraday's law Ampere's law Ampere Maxwell law and so on so I'll just remind you of that so I'm just writing that we learned Gauss's law the first Gauss's law we learned was for charges, and then we learned Gauss's law for magnetism when we talked about the magnetic flux. And then we also learned Faraday's law, and then we learned Ampere Maxwell law. So we wrote these laws in the following form. So, uh, so what I should say is these laws actually were synthesized together into a mathematical theory of electromagnetic waves by James Clerk Maxwell. So they are now called Maxwell's laws. Or Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations will put all the things we've learned into a compact form. So for example, if we write the integral over the closed surface of E dot dA, this was equal to the quantity of free charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. This is called Gauss's law. And then we had the flux law for magnetic fields. This was B integral over a closed surface of B dot dA, and this is equal to zero. This was called uh, Gauss's law for magnetism. And this law arose because we talked about the flux of magnetic fields through a surface. So that's how we ended up with that integral over the closed surface. So then we also had Faraday's law. So the integral over a certain closed loop of the electric field E dot dL was equal to uh, the electromo uh, minus a change in magnetic flux with respect to time, and this was an electromotive force. So this was magnetic flux. This is um, Faraday's law. And then the last one was Ampere Maxwell law. So in this case, we have the integral over the closed loop of B dot dL, and this is equal to the current mu naught times the current density minus epsilon naught mu naught change in magnetic flux change in electric flux with respect to time so this is ampere maxwell law so these four laws together uh together with the lorentz force law the, i'll show you the lorentz force law in a moment so we also learned we also learned that the force on a charged particle in an electric field was F equals Q times E. Remember these forces are all vectors. And then the force on a charged particle uh, moving in a magnetic field, moving with velocity V, is given by F equals Q times V cross B. So these two forces, if you put these two formulas together, you have what is called the Lorentz force law. So the Lorentz force law is just given by F equals QE plus QV cross B. These are all vectors as you can see. And of course you can write it in the following way by taking the charge out. You can write Q and then you have E plus V cross B. So if you have a charged particle which is in an area where there, is, there are both electric and magnetic fields and it's moving with a certain speed, the Lorentz force law allows you to calculate the charge, uh, sorry, the force on that charge. So Maxwell's equations together with the Lorentz force law gives us a complete theory of the electromagnetic uh, field of electromagnetism. Okay, we would go to the electromagnetic wave next. All right, let's go to the next section, which is electromagnetic waves. Okay, so a lot of what we learned all we know about electromagnetic waves starts with our studies of light and refraction experiments in the 19th century. So a lot of that led to the understanding that light is an electromagnetic wave. So we can say that uh, we learned from experiments uh, on interference, uh, refraction that light is a wave. And it was Faraday who was able to show or uh, speculate so Faraday speculated that light contain electric and magnetic portions. And so it, it, through Maxwell's equations, you could show that light is an electromagnetic wave. And we can say that we can 
derive a general wave equation from uh, Maxwell's equations. And I'll just quote this equation. Okay, so I'm just taking E as a one dimensional wave along the X axis. And I'm saying that the partial derivative with respect to E, the X squared is equal to mu naught epsilon naught B squared the T squared. So E has the X and that has a partial with respect to X and a partial with respect to T. Okay, so that's the wave equation for the electric field portion. And then we can also write the wave equation uh, for the magnetic field portion. And I'm going to use the one dimensional version again, B of XT. So we can write partial derivative of B with respect to X squared equals. So these two equations are the wave equations for the electric field and the magnetic field. We can also write the constant and C is the speed of light. Mu naught is permeability of free space, as we already said before, and then epsilon naught is permittivity. This is permittivity. Both of these are constants, and so these three formulas form the form the main electromagnetic wave theory. We can derive electromagnetic waves from Faraday's law. It's done in your book for you, so I won't go through it. It's a very long one, so I'll just leave that for you to look at in your own time if you're interested. But I'll just point out that we can derive these wave equations from using Maxwell's equations. So the, the solution to the two wave equations is a sinusoidal function where the electric field and magnetic field vary with x and t according to the equations so we can say e of x t equals e naught and then we shall use the sine or uh, let's uh, in this case cosine we can use cosine k x minus omega t omega is your angular frequency as usual and then we have b of x t is equal to b naught and we have cosine again of kx minus omega t and i'll say e naught is a maximum and b naught also is a maximum amplitude very good and the omega the angular frequency is omega as usual and the letter k is a wave uh, wave number equal to 2 pi over lambda and lambda is the wavelength and then we have also that um, the ratio of omega to k uh, ratio of omega to k is equal to the speed of the wave so if we write omega over k this is equal to 2 pi f uh, over 2 pi divided by lambda, which can be written as lambda f, which is equal to c. Any questions up to this point? Okay, so one. let's do one more thing. Let's take the partial derivatives. We can show a connection uh, between the electromagnetic, uh, between the electric and magnetic portions of the wave by first taking the partial derivatives of e of x t and b x t so if we take partial with respect to x of e do you know how to take a partial derivative with, res with respect to e of x t so e of x t we said was equal to e naught cosine k x minus omega t <coughs> like that so take the partial derivative of E with respect to X and tell me what you get. Partial with respect to X of E of X T. Yeah, that's correct. Very good. And then now take the partial derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time. So that means you are taking partial with respect to time. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, B of X T. Can somebody verify that? You're taking the derivative with respect to time. So what we see from this is that if you take the partial of E with respect to X and the partial of e, uh, B with respect to T, they are just opposites of each other. So we see that the partial 
with respect to x of e is equal to uh, minus the partial with respect to uh, t of b. Or you can write it the opposite way also. I believe it works out the same way. So partial with respect to e of x is minus a partial with respect to b of t, so that we can so that at a given instant, so at a given instant, the maximum quantities. So at a given instant, uh, let me go to the next page. We will say that uh, omega b naught is equal to uh, minus k e naught. There's a negative sign there like that. Therefore, we can write omega over k equals e naught over b and we know already there's a negative sign sorry we already know that omega over k is equal to c therefore we can say c is equal to minus e naught which is b naught over b naught actually the negative sign goes away because of the way i've written it so i wrote de dx equals minus db dt so the negative should go away so this is positive and there was some error there so that is positive positive so c equals e naught over b naught or we can say e naught equals c times b naught so you can see that the electric and magnetic field are related by the speed of light as you can see so yeah so this brings us to uh, some properties of the electromagnetic wave or uh, electromagnetic field instead one electromagnetic fields are transverse waves it travels at the speed of light in vacuum travels at the speed of light in vacuum uh, number three e equals c b at any point on the wave uh, number four e and b are perpendicular to each other so that e cross b is is the uh, speed or is the direction so this is the direction of propagation of the speed of the wave or the wave speed. So, sorry, this section is 34.6. I should have done it on a different section. Properties of electromagnetic waves. Okay, so those are the properties. So let's go on to look at the energy found in an electromagnetic wave. So the electromagnetic waves can transfer energy just like when, just like uh, regular waves in the ocean, if you, if you, go to the seashore and the waves come in, you can see that the waves transfer energy, they are able to uh, move objects around. So electromagnetic waves can do the same thing, they can transfer uh, energy. We have seen, or uh, we know that ocean waves erode shore lines, sound waves cause our eardrums to vibrate, and so electromagnetic waves also transfer energy to materials and the energy uh, flow in an electromagnetic wave is described by the pointing vector the pointing vector is given by the letter s like that where the pointing vector s is equal to one over mu naught e cross b uh, the pointing vector points to the direction of the electromagnetic wave and the unit of uh, the unit of the magnitude is given by watts per square centimeter so we can say that suppose we have e and e is let's say e is equal to uh, suppose we have the two fields e and b at 90 degrees to each other which is basically what it is, the electric and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. So we can say that, okay, so let me say this way, instead of saying suppose, let's say that since we have uh, two fields at 90 degrees to each other, S is equal to one over mu naught E cross B, this can be written as the magnitude of E and B sine 90 divided by mu naught, which can then be E times B over mu naught. So this gives us the magnitude of the two vectors and the sine of the angle between them. And we also have that E equals uh, C times B. So pointing vector can be written as C B squared over mu naught like that. Or we can write S 
just replacing this time b by e over c to be equal to e squared over c mu naught. So the two give us the same results, of course. Another version can be written as s equals uh, c epsilon naught e squared. So there are three versions that we can use. So those all show us how the electromagnetic field transfers energy and or transfers power. The power uh, is joules per second per unit area. So it's a way of saying that it transfers power per unit area. This idea is important because basically there are people who are proposed using solar sails to travel through space. So we'll look at that very shortly. But let's go on with that. So we can look at the intensity of the electromagnetic wave. So we can also look at the average uh, energy transfer, average energy transfer, average over one cycle, which we call uh, one over one cycle of oscillation, which is the wave intensity. So inten wave intensity has this letter symbol I. So intensity is power per unit area. P is power, A is area, but for our uh, for but for electromagnetic waves, our intensity is given by the average value of Poynting vector. So intensity I can be written as uh, one over two C mu naught e squared. Let's write it that way. So this is the average value of the Poynting vector is one half. E, one half of the pointing vector, which is uh, one over two mu naught e, e squared. So let's look at an application of uh, electromagnetic waves. So we can look at an application of energy stored by looking at radiation pressure. So radiation pressure is uh, what we shall look at next. The reason why this is useful is because if an electromagnetic wave can transfer energy it will also transfer <coughs> the momentum because the two go together. So when an electromagnetic wave impinges on a surface, it transfers both energy and momentum to the surface. Just as much as when you throw a ball against the wall, it's transferring energy as well as momentum. So we can say that electromagnetic waves can transfer not only energy, but also momentum. And we can say that suppose we shine a beam of light on a surface and uh, the light is completely absorbed. So if the light is absorbed in a time interval delta t, then its momentum changes by an amount delta p. So momentum change is equal to energy absorbed divided by the speed c we can say that since momentum changes, we can say that the uh, since momentum is changing, uh, we can say there's a force, there's a, a light exerts a force on the surface given by Newton's second law. We know that the force is given by the change in momentum per unit time. According to the second law, force is dp dt. Or let me write it actually in a different version, in a different way, just to keep it in line. Force is delta P over delta T, where we have delta P equal energy absorbed over C. So we can say that F is equal to uh, the energy absorbed. So P in this case is power. So we can uh, we can explore. The radiation pressure, uh, radiation pressure from the light. So this is the force per unit area on the surface. So radiation pressure is force per unit area, P over C times A, which is intensity per unit area uh, per unit of speed. The intensity is a pressure per unit area. So radiation pressure is given by this quantity. So we can say P rad is equal to I over C. Okay, so let's use an application of radiation pressure to look at a solar sail. So let's apply the idea of radiation pressure to the solar sail. So basically a solar sail is a concept that has was proposed some years ago 
to aid in traveling through space. So people propose that since there's radiation pressure from light, if you take a big enough sail and open it up in space, so you, you fire a rocket in space which contains a big solar sail, so you open it up and point it to the sun, the light beam from the sun impinging on the surface of the sail should transfer both energy and momentum to the sail. And if this goes on over a long period of time, the object behind the sail should gain enough energy, a high, a, a, enough speed to travel through space. That's the whole idea of the solar sail. So let's try the example that is in your textbook. So a low cost, low cost way of sending uh, spacecraft to other planets would be to use uh, the radiation pressure on a solar sail. So the intensity of the sun's electromagnetic energy is 1300 watts per square meter. So the question is what size sail uh, would be needed to accelerate a 10,000 kilogram spacecraft toward mass at uh, 0 0.010 meters per second squared. So you can see the speed is not very much, but we want to accelerate at 0 0.010 0 meters per second squared. Let's assume a perfectly absorbing sail. So we know, so um, the solution is this way. So we want to find the size of the sail. Okay, so pressure intensity is the force, uh, the radiation pressure is a force per unit area. So we need to find the force. And then from that, we can calculate the area if we know the intensity. We already know the intensity of the radiation is 1300 watts per square meter. So we need to find force. And then from that, calculate the area of the sail. So use these formulas, P rad equals force per unit area. And then intensity is equal to uh, the intensity is equal to P rad times the speed of light C. So we can say that intensity is equal to F over A times C. So you should be able to do the calculation. I've given you all the necessary formulas. The radiation pressure is given there. Intensity is given. A is the area that you're looking for. So you should be able to calculate it. So let's first get a force. 10,000 kilograms times 0 0.01. That is your force, 100 Newton. And what is the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation in the orbit? It's given in the question. Yeah, 30, 300, yeah, 1,300 watts per square meter. And so we know the force, we know the intensity, uh, we know speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second squared. So what is the area needed? A equals C F over I. So if you look at what I have on the left, you just bring the A up and then you bring the I down and C. So A equals 2.31 times 10 to the power 7 meters squared. So you can see the sail has to be huge in order to collect enough radiation pressure to meet that uh, small acceleration requirement. So it's not very practical. It's a huge sail. But this is just to illustrate a point to you. There are so many concepts out there, but just to illustrate a point about some of those things, about solar sails and so on. Let's finish up with uh, electromagnetic spectrum. I'll keep this one brief. So we can say that uh, electromagnetic phenomena can be placed for the electromagnetic spectrum. And the spectrum consists of radio and TV waves on one end. Uh, we can have microwaves, then you have uh, infrared spectrum, visible light, then ultraviolet, then we have x-rays on this end, and gamma rays. So the spectrum above is not to scale. Basically, you have a very small portion, which is the visible portion. Um, so this is your visible portion, and then you have your uh, microwaves, TV, radio and microwaves form a very large band in the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible portion is a very small band. Okay, so this is not a scaled uh, diagram. And we can split visible light into its components by using a spectrometer. And this forms the study of what is called spectroscopy. And so we can say that in spectroscopy, we say the spectral measurement instruments 
uh, referred to as spectrometers, uh, spectro, uh, spectrographs, uh, spectrophotometers, or spectral analyzers. And we we'll say that the central theory behind spectroscopy is a resonance phenomena and the corresponding resonance frequency. And so any material that uh, can resonate or oscillate at a high amplitude will produce resonance. So let's look quickly at the types of materials that are used for spectroscopy studies and then we'll stop there. So the types of materials determines uh, the type of spectroscopic study. So for example, we can study uh, atomic spectroscopy, basically absorption of atoms of different elements. So atomic spectroscopy allows the identification and quantification of a sample. And then we can also, of course, do molecular spectroscopy. Uh, there's also uh, spectroscopy of different crystals and then uh, nuclear. And this is just the uh, tip of the iceberg. There are so many other types. So I think that is where we shall stop.